In October of 1628, a trade ship set sail from the Netherlands with gold and gems to be traded for spices in Indonesia. Unbeknownst to the captain, the danger of the voyage was not from the storms and rough waters they'd encounter, but instead something sinister brewing within the ship itself. In the end, this would result in the loss of the majority of the over 300 passengers, but even worse than that, the prolonged suffering of many of the survivors. This is their horrifying story, and as always, viewer discretion is advised. In the Indian Ocean, somewhere off the coast of Western Australia in September of 1629, Captain Francisco Pelser was getting frustrated. For a month, he and his ship, the Sardom, had been looking for one specific island among a chain of 122 of them. And unfortunately, almost all of those islands looked exactly the same. This chain of islands is known as the Houtman Abrolos, and most of them are little more than specks of sand on the horizon. Francisco was looking for one known as Beacon Island, but because of the limits of ship navigation at the time, he couldn't accurately identify the lines of longitude and latitude. Instead, crews used a method called dead reckoning to guide ships in the correct direction. This is when a ship will estimate its position, then sometime later make a calculation of where they're going based on the initial estimate. The problem with this method is that small errors can have a drastic impact over long distances. Just a few degrees off course can result in miles of distance away from where a ship intends to go. In fact, a similar scenario is exactly what got Francisco in trouble in the first place. After weeks of this searching, the Sardom crew was basically just making haphazard passes around an area where they thought Beacon Island was located. And for the most part, all they managed to find was more ocean until one day Francisco finally spotted something in the distance. It looked like plumes of smoke were rising from an island straight ahead. The Sardom then continued on its course and got as close to the island as possible before dropping the anchor and dropping a small rowboat. When they reached the shore, Francisco was surprised to find no one in the immediate vicinity. He couldn't see the source of the smoke either. Then, as he turned around to get back in his rowboat, he saw another small boat approaching the shore. In it were four men frantically paddling toward him. When the boat was close enough, one of them hopped out and ran through knee-deep water and onto dry land. The man then started shouting at Francisco, but he couldn't make out what he was saying until the man got closer. What Francisco was about to learn would have him frantically paddling back to his ship. Almost a full year earlier, on October 28, 1628, Francisco led a fleet of ships off the Dutch island of Texel on its way south around Africa. These eight ships were owned by the Dutch East India Company, also known as the VOC, which is an acronym for its Dutch translation. Their destination was the capital city of the East Indies spice trade, a city called Batavia, which today is Jakarta, Indonesia. Fittingly, the fleet's flagship also went by the name Batavia. When the ship left the Netherlands, it was commanded by Francisco and carried more than 300 crew, soldiers, and wealthy passengers, many of whom were wives traveling to reunite with their husbands in Batavia. The ship itself was completed that same year and was 150 feet long and fixed with 24 cannons, although it wasn't a warship. It was constructed specifically for the spice trade, and within its haul on the trip were 12 chests filled with gold, silver, and gems to be traded for a literal boatload of spices. In the 17th and 18th centuries, the Dutch essentially owned the spice trade, so the route around Africa and into the Indian Ocean was a familiar one but still dangerous. The trade route could be treacherous at times, with the warm waters of the Indian Ocean brewing up typhoons and cyclones, and sailing east in particular was also a challenge because ships would have to sail right into the wind. So between the dangers of weather and the risk of miscalculating dead reckoning, to help ensure successful trips, the VOC chose to sail in fleets rather than send a single ship. This also meant more room for cargo anyway. Right from the beginning, this particular trip didn't get off to the best start. Before the ships even left the North Sea, they were hit by storms and rough seas that splintered the fleet, leaving only three to continue on. On the Batavia, Francisco did his best to alter plans to account for the five missing ships, but the amount of spices they were able to bring back had shrunk significantly. In addition to this loss of cargo capacity, the command structure of the VOC was unique and created tension for the captains. Each of the other ships had its own captain, but aboard the Batavia, there were two, Francisco and another man named Arian Jacobs. Francisco was the fleet commander, so it was natural that he would be on the flagship, but it was the VOC's policy that every boat have a dedicated captain, including the flagship. It was also policy that the captain of the flagship couldn't be captain of the fleet and vice versa, so this meant there was already a natural power struggle on the flagship by default. And this was even more true on this voyage because Francisco and Arian had a bit of a history. While performing these same duties two years earlier, Aaron got extremely drunk one night and started taking verbal shots at Francisco in front of the other men. 
Francesco took this as a challenge to his authority, and compromising his reputation among the men wasn't something he took lightly. So when the fleet returned to the Netherlands, Francisco publicly reprimanded Arian. Afterward, neither man trusted the other, but they were now forced to rely on each other to get a fleet that had been reduced by more than half to Indonesia and back. And on Francisco's side, his mistrust of Arian was well-founded. What he didn't know at the time was that Arian had been plotting a mutiny with a junior merchant named Geronimus Cornelius. Geronimus wasn't a sailor, but he was a high-ranking official within the VOC, and that was good enough to make him Arian's second-in-command. Now, given how long ago this all took place, Geronimus' original purpose for being on the ship at all is contested, but there was a rumor that he joined the voyage to evade arrest for some heretical religious beliefs. Apparently, Geronimus was known to have an obsession with the art of a painter who claimed that his paintings were a collaboration between himself and the spirit world. This artist was eventually imprisoned for heresy, and Geronimus viewed him as a role model of sorts. He apparently did little to hide these beliefs aboard the ship too, allowing him to identify potential allies who shared the same views. But these beliefs extended to something more sinister even. Being on the ship and organizing a mutiny would make it possible to navigate the ship to somewhere remote and start a new colony with him as the ruler. And so Geronimus spent much of the time recruiting mutineers to take part in this scheme. As a warning, here is where things begin to get incredibly dark. This plan called for several crewmen to assault one of the affluent married women on board. The goal was for the crewmen to get caught in the act or afterward, at which point Arian and Geronimus would work to convince the men that Francisco's punishment was harsh and unfair, leading to a mutiny. The Batavia then stopped at the Cape of Good Hope near Cape Town, South Africa to pick up supplies, and the mutiny plan would get underway as soon as the ship left. Once it did, the crewmen who volunteered for this part of the plan went below deck to assault the 27-year-old woman they picked out. However, inside the dark hall, it was impossible for her to see who her attackers were. This meant that when she was unable to identify them later, horrifyingly, the issue was completely dropped. And even worse, although Arian and Geronimus' plan had failed, Francisco still had no idea about their plan. In fact, he was distracted by the accomplishment of getting to the Cape of Good Hope a month ahead of schedule. Despite the rough start, things had been smooth for months as the Batavia worked its way around Africa. Their good fortune wouldn't last much longer, however, and shortly after entering the Indian Ocean, a storm came up and separated the last three ships. When the weather cleared, the Batavia was alone, and Francisco realized that's how they have to cross the Indian Ocean. With time running out before their final destination, Arian and Geronimus needed a plan B. So when Arian ordered the ship to depart the Cape of Good Hope, he intentionally began guiding the ship off its intended course, and with no objective instruments to measure this, Francisco was once again in the dark about what was being done around him. Then, in the early morning hours of June 4th, 1629, the captain was sleeping in his bunk when the Batavia suddenly and violently came to a dead stop with a tremendous noise. Now, wrecking the ship was not part of the plan Arian and Geronimus came up with. The intention of going off course was either to paint Francisco as an inept commander or buy themselves more time to come up with a better plan. What actually happened was the result of Arian badly miscalculating dead reckoning for his new route, and the ship crashed into Morning Reef just off the coast of Western Australia in the Helpman Abrolos Islands. During the crash, a handful of crew, soldiers, and passengers ended up in the ocean through the cracked hull and were never seen again. These would be just the first of many to come. The Batavia, meanwhile, was damaged beyond repair, and its maiden voyage would be its last. In the immediate aftermath of the crash, the ship's longboats were deployed and crewmen started ferrying people to an island just to their northwest. By sunrise, around 180 people, including 30 women and children, were relatively safe on Beacon Island. That morning, Francisco ordered a search of the air for water and food while he instructed others to salvage what they could from the ship. Unfortunately, all that could be collected were a few barrels of biscuits and some water. Estimates vary on the number of people who died in the wreck, but it's thought to be somewhere between 30 and 50 meaning that some biscuits and water weren't going to support the survival of nearly 300 people for very long. And unfortunately, Beacon Island wasn't going to either. It was more of an outcropping than an island. It has an area of roughly 13 acres, and all of that area is basically just sand and small shrubs. And although it's part of a chain of 122 islands about 50 miles west of the Australian mainland, most of the chain looked more or less similar to Beacon Island. This meant that Francisco had to figure something out quickly, or they would all begin to starve. So with his senior officers, he came up with a plan to sail one of the longboats to mainland Australia to see if survival there would be any easier. The next night, Francisco led 48 people, including Arian, back into the Indian Ocean on a course for Australia. The trip there was unremarkable, and Francisco organized the men for a search of the vicinity right away. Unfortunately, after hours of looking, the mainland wasn't much better, so Francisco had to make another decision. 
He could either return to Beacon Island and regroup or turn the longboat north toward Batavia, more than 1,800 miles away, and hope for the best. The problem was that the type of longboat they had was not built for long journeys, let alone through rough water. This style of ship was more like a lengthier rowboat, low to the water and with nothing to protect those on board from the elements. It was basically only designed to get people from a sinking ship to some kind of safety and nothing more. At the same time, going back to Beacon Island without supplies was likely going to be the end for everyone anyway, either by dehydration or starvation. If they tried for Indonesia and didn't make it, at least they'd die while trying to save themselves and the others. So with that, Francisco made up his mind they were going to reach Indonesia or die trying. Back on Beacon Island, several days after crashing into the reef, the Batavia finally broke apart and sank, increasing the wreck's death toll by another 40 people. Unfortunately, Geronimus managed to make it to shore and evade being dragged down with the others. By then as well, those who survived the ship's sinking were beginning to feel as though Francisco had abandoned them. When he left Beacon Island, he'd never mentioned the possibility of heading north to Batavia, so even though he was trying to save them, the remaining passengers were afraid and resentful. And in this shift of morale, Geronimus saw an opportunity. He put forth the idea to elect a new leader on the island now that Francisco and Arian were gone. And as it so happened, when the votes were in, Geronimus was appointed the new leader. It wouldn't take long to realize just how bad a decision this was. With the other mutineers Geronimus had recruited, the first thing he did with his newfound power was order that all weapons, food, boats, and rafts be confiscated. Next, he knew he had to essentially divide and conquer since he and his men were outnumbered. His plan was to reduce their numbers from around 250 people down to 120, and he started by sending 45 men, women, and cabin boys to Seal Island, about one mile away and visible from Beacon Island. And since he knew people wouldn't go if they knew he was sending them to die, he instead asked them to search for resources. However, he had no intention of ever returning to save them. He then convinced the soldiers, led by Weeb Hayes, to sail to West Wallaby Island, about five and a half miles away, to see what they could find there. If they found anything, like a freshwater source, they were instructed to send up smoke signals so they could be picked back up. What Geronimus actually planned to do, though, was send his men back to West Wallaby Island if they saw smoke signals and kill the unarmed mercenaries. That's only if they made it to the island in the first place. Geronimus believed that Francisco and the others must have encountered rough seas and capsized after leaving the island. So he sent the soldiers in the same direction, hoping they might suffer the same fate. Then, for weeks afterward, the situation just continued to escalate. He continued to send survivors on missions to other islands, but eventually this transformed into his men simply taking people out into the ocean and just pushing them overboard. Then once he felt like his biggest threats were off of Beacon Island, he dropped the facade and showed his true colors for the first time. One by one, Geronimus chose who lived and who died. Many of the wives on the voyage to join their husbands also became his property to do with as he pleased. He also quickly eliminated the sick and disabled, and for the stronger of the remaining castaways, Geronimus ordered sneak attacks at night. His men would creep into the camp and finish them off while they slept. During this reign of terror, at least two mass burials took place, one of which contained an entire family including six children. For all his power and cruelty though, Geronimus was too weak-willed to do any of it himself. He apparently tried once when he poisoned an infant, but the child survived. Then since he couldn't do it, he ordered one of his men to do it instead. During this time as well, he kept a close eye on the groups he dropped off on nearby islands. Like for example, when he noticed that the group he sent to Seal Island wasn't dying fast enough for his liking, he sent a group of his men to the island and watched through a telescope as they sped up the process. The soldiers meanwhile, several miles away, were thriving on West Wallaby Island. They found a plentiful freshwater source and there were plenty of small marsupials and birds there that were enough to survive on. For days, the soldiers sent up smoke signals as ordered, completely unaware of what was happening on Beacon Island. Then, one day, some of the survivors who were originally sent to Seal Island showed up on a makeshift raft. That's when Weeb and the other mercenaries were told everything. And after Geronimus had gotten rid of many of those who remained on Beacon Island, he could turn his attention back to the inhabitants of West Wallaby Island. The smoke signals were concerning because he didn't expect the soldiers to find anything at all, so this meant that they had found critical resources they needed to survive. And if they were thriving on West Wallaby Island, it was also possible that a ship could be attracted to the island by the rising smoke. If a ship reached the soldiers first and picked them up before coming to Beacon Island for the others, there was little chance of overthrowing those on board. It would also mean that Geronimus would be executed for everything he'd done. At the same time, knowing what he'd been doing on Beacon Island, we figured it was only a matter of time before Geronimus came for them. So as best they could with what they had available to them, the mercenaries made crude weapons to defend themselves. Then, using limestone, coral, and debris from the Batavia that washed up on the island, they even managed to build a small fortress and set up round-the-clock watches. 
when the time came, the mercenaries would be prepared. As all of this was going on, after 33 days at sea, the longboat carrying Francisco, Arian, and nearly 50 crewmen miraculously arrived in Batavia. Even today, this is considered an incredible feat of sailing, even if it was aided by the islands they found along the way to stop for food, water, and places to rest. Shortly after arriving in Batavia, Francisco met with the Governor General to discuss the shipwreck and some details he'd been informed of on their journey. Some of the crewmen told Francisco that they'd been approached by Arian and Geronimus to join them in a mutiny. Francisco then shared these details with Indonesian authorities and Arian was immediately arrested. But even despite knowing about the planned mutiny by that point, no one had any idea of the full scope of what was happening on Beacon Island in their absence. A week after landing, Francisco then left Batavia once again to rescue the others in a ship known as the Sardom, which the Governor General let him use. It would then take a month just to get to the Helpman Abrolos, but then another month after that was spent scanning the water, looking for the little sandy outcropping that is Beacon Island. Almost two months earlier, in early August, just as Francisco and the others were arriving in Batavia, several mercenaries on watch spotted a longboat heading toward them. Aboard this boat were a handful of Geronimus's men. Since he was under the assumption that the soldiers were unarmed, Geronimus figured he didn't need his whole crew to dispatch the 22 mercenaries of West Wallaby Island. Thankfully, he couldn't have been more wrong. When the ship reached West Wallaby Island, his henchmen were immediately attacked and caught completely off guard, forcing them to retreat back to Beacon Island. Geronimus was not pleased to hear about this when his men returned to Beacon Island, so he ordered a second attack and went with them this time, believing he could strong-arm the mercenaries into joining him. This time, he sent more men, but they were still no match for the soldiers. And so before he could leave the island, Geronimus, along with three of his lieutenants, were captured by Weeb. Some of his men did manage to escape the attack and return to Beacon Island, but with many of his henchmen lying dead on the West Wallaby Island sand, Geronimus was made to watch as his lieutenants were executed. Back on Beacon Island, the men who were still loyal to him regrouped under a new leader, a man named Wouter Luce. In late September, these men returned to West Wallaby Island to fight the mercenaries, only this time they brought muskets with them that Geronimus had been saving for his planned hijacking of any rescue ship. The hand weapons the mercenaries had were obviously no match for these muskets, and they fought bravely, but it seemed like only a matter of time before they would be overtaken. Then, as the fighting continued, someone spotted a ship in the distance. In an instant, the fighting stopped as the rescue ship became the priority for both sides, but for very different reasons. Aboard the Sardom, Francisco had spotted smoke to his west, but he mistakenly believed it was coming from another island which lies between West Wallaby Island and Beacon Island. He then directed the Sardom as close as he could to the island, dropped the anchor, and boarded a longboat. With a barrel of water, some bread, and a keg of wine, Francisco was surprised to find no one on the island and saw that the smoke was actually coming from further west. Then, as he turned to go back to his boat, he spotted another boat with four men in it, frantically paddling toward him, and immediately recognized it was Weeb. When the boat pulled onto the island, Weeb raced to meet Francisco and started shouting at him as he did. Francisco, Weeb, and the three others with him immediately hurried to the Sardom to warn the crew and defend the ship. And while on the way, Weeb filled Francisco in on all the details of what happened after he left three months earlier. Unfortunately, there wasn't much time to react to this news. Vouter and his men were simultaneously nearing the Sardom. Thankfully, Francisco's boat beat them there and the captain shouted orders to the men to take defensive positions. When Vouter's boat pulled up alongside the Sardom and the men climbed aboard, they were met by Francisco and dozens of muskets pointed directly at them. They all then placed their weapons on the ground and surrendered. After that, every one of the remaining mutineers was captured and Francisco began to learn the full details of the atrocities in his absence. A 49-year-old mutineer was particularly forthcoming about his involvement and admitted to killing up to 20 people in compliance with Geronimus' orders. Francisco then asked to be taken to Geronimus, and he was led to the shelter where Geronimus was being held captive. Francisco then launched into the accusations and the claims others had made about his actions, but in answering every question, Geronimus placed the blame on anyone and anything but himself, refusing to confess to any of what he was accused of. So shortly after this initial confrontation, Francisco carried out a series of investigations and trials on the island. This investigation revealed the awful details of the murders and assaults perpetrated by Geronimus and his men. By the conclusion of the investigation, every last one of the mutineers had admitted to their crimes except Geronimus. The worst offenders among them were sentenced to death, and when the time came to carry out the punishment on October 2nd, 1629, the mutineers were brought to Seal Island. The other castaways had been asked to build gallows there, and when the condemned arrived, their right hands were removed before being hanged. Many of the survivors watched in relief as each of the worst mutineers was brought to the gallows one by one. Geronimus was also hanged that day, but both his hands were removed before he met the same fate as the other mutineers.
Others who had committed lesser crimes were dealt with differently. One of the soldiers who defected and a cabin boy who defended Geronimus were left marooned on mainland Australia. Interestingly, they became the very first Europeans to live on the continent and are still regarded somewhat as celebrated pioneers, despite the circumstances that led them there. The Sardom then left the Houtman Abrolos with the 77 remaining survivors and 16 mutineers destined for a more official trial in Batavia. Five of the mutineers didn't even make it that far as they were flogged, keelhauled, and dropped from the yardum high above the ship into the ocean on the way. And while Velter's actions were almost as egregious as the acts Geronimus committed, Francisco decided to bring him to Batavia instead. And when his trial was complete, his punishment was the worst of any of those aligned with Geronimus. He was sentenced to the breaking wheel. Being broken on the wheel, as it was called, was considered the most gruesome form of punishment at the time. And it truly was a horrific punishment. To be as non-descriptive as possible, the gist is that the condemned was mangled to the point of being able to be tied to a large wheel where further punishment would occur as the wheel spun. This was eventually set ablaze high above a crowd of onlookers. Strangely enough, if the condemned fell off the wheel at any point during the punishment, it was viewed as a sign from God to show mercy and leave the criminal to live. Voucher, however, remained firmly attached to the wheel. As for Arian, he was physically punished by Batavian officials, but still never confessed to any of the accusations made against him, so he was eventually spared for a lack of evidence. Weeb was celebrated for his bravery in fighting off the mutineers and capturing Geronimus, and he was promoted to a higher military rank as a result. The island is also referred to as its unofficial name, Weeb Hayes Island. Today, a statue of Weeb can be found on the western Australian coast, and the remains of the fort he built are still present on the island. It's believed to be the oldest European structure built on Australian land. Francisco, for all his effort to reach help and rescue the others, was subject to an inquiry that admonished him for a lack of leadership and not set up command before he left for Western Australia. But unfortunately, it was determined that he was still partially to blame for the tragedy. His reputation was completely ruined, his assets were seized, and he would die from an unspecified illness within a year of his return to Batavia with the others. When it left the Netherlands in October of 1628, it did so with between 322 and 341 people. Of them, only 122 made it to Batavia. It's believed Geronimus was responsible for the deaths of at least 109 castaways, with some estimates as high as 125. The rest were either due to illness, starvation, or the initial shipwreck. The wreck of the Batavia was lost to time until it was located in 1963, and the remains of the bow can now be viewed at the Western Australia Museum. If you made it this far, thanks so much for watching. If you have a story suggestion I'd love to hear, you can submit it to the form found in the description. And hopefully, I will see you in the next one.